Uh, and then that was how Rotten Tomatoes was born. He basically went from idea to launching a site in two weeks and he built it all in static HTML because he wasn't an engineer, he wasn't a coder at the time. Hey everyone, this is Rick and welcome back to the Seed the Startup Journey, the entrepreneurship podcast sharing the origin stories of amazing founders and the companies in under 20 minutes. I'm super excited for today's episode because we'll be chatting with the co-founder of Rotten Tomatoes, Patrick Lee. If you've ever searched for a movie and wondered if it's worth watching, you've probably come across Rotten Tomatoes. Patrick was the CEO who led the company through very challenging times, including the dot-com crash as well as 9-11. After selling Rotten Tomatoes in 2004, Patrick went on to found three other companies, a true serial entrepreneur with an amazing startup journey. Now before we begin, a lot of my viewers on actually subscribed. So go ahead and smash the subscribe button right now and if by the end of this episode you didn't like our content, just press it again to unsubscribe. Easy enough? Let's get to it. Hey Patrick, thank you so much for coming on to our podcast today. You're the most well known for starting Rotten Tomatoes, but you're actually a serial entrepreneur having founded more than six startups. So could you take us back to the beginning of your startup journey? Like, Was there a moment for you when you knew you wanted to become an entrepreneur? Yeah, so I started my first startup, what would have been my junior year of uh, college at Berkeley. And for me, I think it was really about being a bit impatient. Um, I just felt like school was a little bit too slow and boring at the time. And I really wanted to just get out there and start doing something. And so I had three uh, really good friends, Lyle, Jimmy, and Oliver, that I convinced to leave school to try and do something together. Um, I think that was pretty much the point where I decided to kind of strike off on my own. Our first company that I did was um, selling computer systems and components. So it wasn't like any kind of fancy startup or anything. We'd place orders down South Drive for half an hour to an hour, depending on traffic, to go pick up the parts and then come back and like build computers for people. Um, so it wasn't very glamorous or anything like that. But I think it was more about just getting out there and, and doing something. Yeah. So your first company was you know, basically selling computer components. The second company was web design and Run Tomatoes was actually your third company, I believe. Um, so could you kind of share with us how Run Tomatoes was born? I heard it has something to do with the movie Rush Hour. My second company, I was doing a web design firm focused on the entertainment industry. And we had a creative director, Sen Duong, who came up with the idea for Run Tomatoes. He was a huge movie fan, huge Jackie Chan fan, and he wanted to know what everyone was saying about the movie Rush Hour when it was coming out. He would go to the library to go look up magazines and newspapers to see what everyone was saying. Uh, so his idea was, you know, back in the day, you would open up a newspaper, you would see a full page ad for a movie, and it would look like a movie poster filled with quotes. And those quotes would always be good, even if the movie was not good. Um, and they would just use uh, folks that were not professional critics. So Sen's idea was, what if I put only quotes from professional critics but I put all the quotes, good and bad, in one place, and then put a score on it for the percentage of critics that recommend seeing the movie. Uh, and then that was how Rotten Tomatoes was born. He basically went from idea to launching a site in two weeks, and he built it all in static HTML because he wasn't an engineer. He wasn't a coder at the time. We were hosting it for him, and within that first year, you know, he was getting mentioned on like Yahoo, on Netscape, this film critic Roger Ebert, wrote an article highlighting his favorite movie websites and Rotten Tomatoes was one of them. And I remember when A Bug's Life came out, we saw a spike in traffic and it turned out that that traffic was coming from Pixar. So, and that was all within the first year. So after that, we decided to you know, talk to Sen about working together and basically put our whole design team over to focus only on Rotten Tomatoes, gave the design from off to another group to take over, uh, raise some money, and then started running Rotten Tomatoes as a real company. But what was the reason for that? Because I, I believe that with your design company, you were doing very well too. You were getting good traction from clients like Disney. So what made you decide to do that shift? Um, I think the biggest reason was because even though we were working on, on sites for the entertainment industry and that was interesting, it was never really our own thing. We would be building these websites for other clients um, and they would have usually very, very tight deadlines with lots and lots of changes. And at the same time, we were also helping friends with their websites um, that were running tech companies. And a number of them ended up raising 
you know, a lot of money or uh, exiting for a lot more. And we just thought it, would, it made more sense for us to try to build something that was really our own. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas with our web design company, everything, it was a services based company and it just didn't seem like it would scale as well. Like if we got twice as much work, we'd have to have twice as many employees to do that work. Whereas with something like Rotten Tomatoes, we could serve 10x, 100x the number mm-hmm. of users and we didn't have to hire even one extra person in that situation. Got it. So it sounds like up to that point, everything was going well. Like I think you raised a million dollars for Rotten Tomatoes. Um, it's like one of those Silicon Valley success stories. Uh, but Patrick, I have a list of numbers here. 25, 21, 17, 14, 11, and 7. Do you recall what those numbers are? Yeah, those were the numbers of employees we had when we first raised money uh, for Rotten Tomatoes and we transferred a design team over. And then as we had to let go of people, that was the headcount that we had. And we basically had to cut from 25 people down to seven within the course of about a year because uh, right after we raised money in January 2000, in March 2000, the market just completely crashed. Um, And so it was just a really tough time if we didn't let go of people, we would run out of funding very quickly and would have to shut everything down. So we did what we could to get our costs down. And really the biggest cost was in salary. And so not only did we cut to seven, two of us additionally went to uh, no salary of the seven and the other five people took a 30% pay cut. So we were operating at seven at more like the cost of about three people or so. Yeah, so like, I'm actually really impressed because even though it was 20 years ago, you still remember those numbers. And I heard you were like sleeping under the desk and you know hiding from security guards as well. Um, so like, thank you for sharing that because I think oftentimes when we think of entrepreneurs, we think of it as like really glamorous, but like clearly you had to also go through a lot of tough challenges. So I'm also wondering like, how did you manage to keep yourself like mentally sane and deal with all the stress? Um, like, was it by playing Diablo 2 or watching anime? Yeah, we did watch some anime during that time. Uh, some people were really into a show called Slam Dunk, uh, which is a famous basketball anime. And so when we had to cut down, we ended up subleasing some space to a friend's company where they also had to do even bigger, a bigger cut. They went from like 100 something, 130 employees down to like a dozen. And so they ended up subleasing some extra space from us. Um, and that was, it was hard times. But yeah, uh, some of those, one of the employees would download like the latest subtitled version of Slam Dunk and the subtitles were done by, you know, just random fans. And we would all just gather around and watch it together. After work at Rotten Tomatoes at night, you know, about half the company would end up uh, booting up Diablo 2 so we could start all playing together. Um, And that was super fun. We play on nights and weekends pretty much for months straight like that. The thing I think that made it easier, even though things were hard, uh, the world outside was going crazy. You know, we had to go through the stock market crash, 18 months after that was 9-11, um, just a really crazy time. But for us, what made it bearable was that we could see that our traffic, our revenue, our brand were constantly increasing. Maybe not week over week, but like on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, you could see that it was it was growing. And that helped us to keep pushing forward. I think it would have been a lot harder if our you know, if everything was flat or declining. You eventually sold Rotten Tomatoes in 2004, around that time. Um, what was the reason for that? At the time, you know, had been running for about five years or so. And it got to a point where I think part of it was, you know, our fault. We didn't really see much bigger. We thought if we just keep running it, it's going to be a, more of the same, you know, probably more traffic, more revenue, more brand, but not much changes. We weren't thinking big or anything like that versus being able to you know sell get our investors uh, make our investors a little bit of money you know for all of us to kind of take some money off the table um and then raise money to do something new try something different and i would say looking back i think we did not fully appreciate what we had built with ron tomatoes we knew it was was good but we didn't realize how hard it would be to uh build another company like that. You know, I think we were quite lucky in that in my first three companies, the first company didn't really go anywhere, but the second company, you know, we got to pretty large clients 
fairly easily. And with Rotten Tomatoes, we also got it to an interesting place fairly easily, not, you know, not counting all the external things that were happening to us, but we hit product market fit almost immediately. And so I think because of these last two companies, everything just seemed like whatever we want to do, is this going to work? And so I think it was more about, hey, we're young. Let's just try something new. Yeah. And so after selling it, I believe you started three other companies. Um, and you've also recently taken a break to like see friends and families. Um, kind of fast forward to now in 2021. Where would you say you are now along your startup journey? Like kind of what's the next chapter for you? Right. So I think for me, after doing three more companies after Ron Tomatoes, I just got quite burned out. I uh, had been doing six companies over 22, 23 years. I just needed a change of pace. And so I don't think I will do another startup. I just think the time and effort that it takes and where I am in my life, it just doesn't really make sense anymore. And so I've been looking a lot more at investing, you know, mentoring, working with startups, investing into startups. And so I've been kind of running some experiments around that side uh, with a couple other tech founder friends where we been looking at identifying interesting companies and trying to get really, you know, strong tech founders to invest into those companies and kind of support each other. The other thing for me, um, my other, I guess, project, I would say, is I got married last October, came to Taiwan to take a look, a longer look at it, uh, because in the past, I've only ever been here usually a, a week every few years or I think I was here for a month in high school, which was a very long time ago. And so I wanted to come to check it out. Plan was to come for three months, decided to extend it. And then my wife ended up getting pregnant. So we are, you know, expecting towards later this year. And we plan to, you know, take advantage of the postpartum centers here in Taiwan. So right now that is really the top priority is just really figuring everything out as far as having this new addition to the family and just kind of getting ready for the baby. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at now. That's awesome. Congratulations for everything. Thank you. Um, and so I also wanted to talk about, because I think in previous interviews, like when you were asked, you know, what industries are sort of the next big things and what you're interested in, you mentioned artificial intelligence and genetic engineering. Crypto and blockchain, you said not so much because those are more money centric. But I recently saw that you were uh, promoting a bid for NFTs of influential Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So I was wondering if your views has changed about blockchain and what the next big thing is. I mean, my feelings about blockchain and stuff are still kind of the same. I, for me, I, I never really did startups. It wasn't really about the money. It was really about doing something with friends and doing something I thought was interesting. And I think with like blockchain, you know, a lot, I feel like a lot of the people who kind of are in it are really financially focused. They're in it to, to really just make money. They're not so much focused on like, hey, how do we make the world a better place? Some folks are, but, but I would say the vast majority, I don't get that sense. Right. And with doing the NFT for good, it was more, you know, some friends were trying to put something together around NFTs, but rather than just try to make a quick buck, they were actually trying to raise money for charity. Um, and I thought that was a good cause. So that one, I, I was fine with, you know, lending my support. As far as the next big thing, you know, I've seen in since my time, multiple waves of technology come through. Uh, in the 80s, it was desktop computing. In the 90s, it was the internet. Then it was mobile. And so right now, each time when a wave of technology comes through, there are a whole new set of companies that spring up because of it. And if you really did it right, you end up becoming huge. I mean, the biggest companies in the world right now, Microsoft and Apple came during desktop computers. Um, internet created like Google and Amazon. You know, mobile uh, helped with, with Facebook and Uber and companies like that. Mm -hmm. I think the next wave of technology is probably either artificial intelligence. I mean, most likely artificial intelligence. I do think there's some interesting stuff, again, around genetic engineering um, as well. Uh, it's kind of a different path, but um, with genetic engineering, we potentially could be curing things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, mm -hmm. cancer, which would be absolutely amazing. Um, and I know another area I think is very interesting is the metaverse, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like Ready Player One or yeah. The Matrix, right? Like for everyone to be kind of connected together digitally in a virtual 
world. Um, I think it doesn't have to be VR, AR, although I, they can make the experience better. But you look at things like Fortnite and Minecraft and Roblox, and right now people are already connect, connecting digitally using avatars, except stuff like that. And I think it's just going to get bigger. Right now, you know, 20% of all of Facebook's resources are working on Oculus and VR. I mean, over 10,000 people. That's pretty crazy. Apple's about to release uh, some AR glasses. You know, Microsoft has HoloLens and they own Minecraft and Google and Amazon and everyone's looking at that space. So I think it's just something that's really interesting. And if it really does manage to take off in its perfect form, you know, would it be Facebook 2.0? Would it be Internet 2.0? I mm -hmm. think that area is quite interesting. And I do think if you're talking about the metaverse, blockchain will actually play an important part because mm -hmm. of the NFTs. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the virtual world, there's not going to be any physical objects anymore. So you're going to need some good representation of that. Gotcha. Yeah, it's definitely super exciting. And like, I really like Ready Player One. So definitely looking forward to seeing a world like that. Um, and Patrick, I also wanted to get some advice from you because I know that you talked a lot in the past about focus, how you think startup founders should focus on one feature, one category, one market in the very beginning. But my question is, even before that, like when we're still coming up with ideas, like sometimes I have a bunch of ideas I think are cool and I kind of want to just dip my toes in all of them. How do we decide which ideas to focus on and when do we know to pivot or move on to something new? I would say a few things. One, ideally, you want to be trying to solve a problem. It's easiest if, if it's a problem that you are having, kind of like a sand with Rotten Tomatoes and trying to see what all the critics are saying about Rush Hour. I think ideas that don't solve any problems tend to be harder to pull off successfully. It has happened, but... Um, I think if you're actually trying to solve a problem, it tends to work better. The second thing I would say is whatever idea you have, think about how you can test that idea as quickly and cheaply as possible. For example, if you're trying to do almost any kind of marketplace, a lot of times you can pull that off with just a mailing list. You know, you can get a bunch of buyers um, to subscribe to your mailing list and get a bunch of the sellers to list things onto them. You can connect these two groups together and then see if any kind of transactions happen. And if you're able to get some transactions happening, then you might think about like investing more time into building out a website or an app or something like that, right? But if you just want to test really quickly, oh, hey, well, you know, can I make a marketplace for, I don't know, Pokemon cards? Then you can just go in, list a bunch, and if people buy it on from the mailing list, then you know something's there, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's really a big thing is a lot of times people have an idea and Either they end up spending way too much time researching it, writing a business plan, talking about it, and they never actually build anything, or they spend too much time building something, mm -hmm. um, a website or an app, spending months, all their savings, hiring people or, or all their time, and never actually like launching it and taking just way too long to launch it. And mm -hmm. instead, I'm like, try and launch as quickly as possible, even like the most basic form. And sometimes it can be 100% manual. You know, um, and then see if there's something there. You know, with Sen, he went from idea to launch in just two weeks. You know, he built the site in static HTML because he he couldn't code. That's the kind of time that I think people should be putting in. And then if you're able to launch things within, say, two weeks each time, you can probably test a lot of ideas in just within a few months. I love that. Yeah, even if it's just lines of static HTML, it could turn into a huge company like Rotten Tomatoes. Um, so that, that's awesome. Um, I have a quick question from my audience, and that kind of goes back to Rotten Tomatoes. When the reviews from movie critics and the reviews from the audience, or even from yourself, are very different, how do you feel about that? Um, I think it's actually good because critics, the thing with critics is they have to watch everything, but they tend to prefer more like drama, Oscar type films, indie films, art house films, film festival films, right? The average, you know, user or audience member, they choose what they see. They don't see everything and they have to pay for it. And so they're more predisposed to want to like whatever it is that they put money down to see. And audience in general will prefer things like the summer blockbuster movies, you know, comedies, romantic comedies, action, those kinds of things. 
So it's, it makes sense that they don't always agree. If they both agree and they say it's fresh or rotten, it's, it's very accurate. And when they don't agree, you need to see which one you tend to agree more with. I'm actually more into like the summer blockbuster films. So in that case, when they don't agree, I'll tend to side more with the audience. Uh, yeah, and speaking of ratings, uh, I prepared a quick game. It's called Ryan or Fresh. Basically, I'll throw you a lot of titles of anime or video games and just quickly rate them. First one, One Piece. Fresh. My Hero Academia. Fresh. Attack on Titan. Fresh. Crazy Rich Asians. Fresh. Overwatch. Fresh. League of Legends. I haven't really played it. Awesome. <laughs> so that's it for today's interview. Thank you so much for coming on again. And you know, I wish you the best of luck. You know, Taiwan's food is awesome. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that as well. And yeah, thank you again for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, great job with the questions and the research. I hope you enjoyed this episode. My main takeaways from chatting with Patrick are to solve a problem, get started fast, and also to understand that startups aren't always fancy and glamorous. It is hard and you have to be prepared for the challenges. Now I'll be discussing my takeaways in more detail in a separate episode a few days after this one is published, so be sure to stay tuned on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. With that, make sure you share this podcast with your friends and let's grow our seed of innovation and creativity together. I'll see you next time.